Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Sir, am I audible to you? Yeah, yeah, you are. It's clear. Yeah, thank you. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Okay. Sir, would you? Would... So can you can you hear me there? Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Perfectly. Oh, yeah, now we can hear. We just for a moment lost your voice. Oh, yeah, okay. now we can hear. Yeah, this is fine. Is it, uh, I mean, audible at the back? Yeah, it is completely. It's completely. Okay. Thank you. So, should I just start or? I mean, no, no, we will first introduce you. Oh. On one we should introduce you. No, no, I you should go. Well, uh, Professor Arpachakrapadhyay, he is the Assistant Professor at IIT Humanities, Gandhinagar. And obviously, he is a specialist in a lot of things for me, but he specializes in um, Beckett and Lafayette studies. And so, the reason behind today's uh, special lecture is to make us access to his uh, repertoire of knowledge. And Orkoda, uh, we would like to introduce this is uh, the BA SEM3 students. Hi. So, yes. So uh, I have referred to a couple of your lectures online for them on certain aspects of Lako, but I said it is best to hear from the horse's mouth. So oh. we leave it to you to continue. Thank you so much, Pradosh, and thank you so much for this opportunity to interact with everybody. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to overcome the glitches of technology. So at any point, if you can't understand what I'm saying, Please let me know. Otherwise, uh, I, I won't. I won't get it because sometimes uh, it could be clear. I mean, you could hear the voice, but you may not make out what I'm saying, right? So please let me know if you can't understand what I'm saying. So uh, as far as I understand, we are looking at two uh, classes on Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Purloined Letter. So for today, I will try and stick to the text as much as possible and talk about certain aspects of the text. Uh, we will go into perhaps more about the history of its interpretations in the next class, but provided we have some time, we might go into it as well, uh, especially in the final few minutes of today. So uh, I'm sure as students of English literature, you already have an idea about Edgar Allan Poe and even, you know, the, the interesting thing about Poe is that Poe is a widely studied writer outside the academia as well. I'm sure most of you have read some of his stories, at least one story while growing up. Uh, now, the Poe that most of us know uh, is a writer of Gothic narratives, a writer of horror stories, or a writer of Gothic narratives. Historically, he's often associated with uh, American Romanticism as a movement, but the, the branch of romanticism he represents is a gothic romanticism. So his dates are 1809 to 1849. And uh, as you can understand, he had a, he had a, he had a relatively short life. Uh, apart from one 
a relatively longer narrative, the narrative of Gordon Pym, all he has written is a set of short stories and poems. So just to briefly introduce Poe before we quickly go into the Purloined Letter, uh, one text that if you're interested, I would ask you to read alongside uh, the Purloined Letter is uh, uh, an essay called The Philosophy of Composition. Uh, the Raven is another famous poem which some of you might have already read. Uh, the Philosophy of Composition is an essay where Poe, as a writer, talks about his own writing process and what is it that interests him as a writer and, and might find that interesting. It's not directly related to this particular story, but you might find that interesting in, in general. Now, the first thing to, to, to clarify here is that we are not looking at a Gothic story. So the story that we have here, the story that you have in your syllabus, the Purloined Letter, is not a Gothic story. In fact, more than that, it's, it's, it's like a detective story. It's a detective story more than a Gothic story. And there are three such detective stories that Poe wrote. Uh, the first two are The Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Murders in the Rue Morgue. The second one is the Mystery of Mary Roger, and this is the third one, The Purloined Letter. Okay, This story came out for the first time in 1844. Okay, 1844. It appeared in the journal titled The Gift, and then came out, it had many reprints. It was a very famous story, a story that became very popular. Uh, interestingly, at this point, Poe has already established his detective, this character of Auguste Dupont. So Dupont, D-U-P-I-N, Dupont is the detective figure in both these two stories I mentioned, The Murders in the Rue Morgue and The Mystery of Marie Roger. And this is the third and final story involving Dupont. Uh, and it's quite a departure from the first two stories. So again, if you have the time, if you have the opportunity, please read the first two. I mean, because we just have two classes, I can't go into the details of those two stories. But it's a very interesting departure from the first two stories, Murders in the Rue Morgue and The Mystery of Marie Roger. Uh, now, this story, as you know, is set in Paris, which is one of the reasons why uh, there is a huge amount of French literature on this short story. And the reception of the story was bigger in France than in America. And that's kind of true of Edgar Allan Poe. So none other than the great French modernist poet or proto-modernist poet Charles Baudelaire translated this story in 1856. In 1856, about 10 years after its initial English publication, it was translated by Baudelaire as La Lettre Volée. And there's something to be said about this translation, La Lettre Volée. It's spelled L A La L E T T R E, Lettre, and Volée is V O L E E, with an accent on the first E. Now, the, the point about this translation, if we have the time, we'll come back to this, is that Volée means stolen. Voli is stolen. So, uh, Baudelaire's perhaps, I don't know whether it's creative or deliberate or not, but Baudelaire's translation it would have us believe that uh, there is no distinction between a purloined letter and a stolen letter. But this is what we will see. Uh, a purloined letter is not necessarily a stolen letter. So what is a purloined letter? Think of it like this. Purloined letter is like a mislaid book. So you go to the library and you know on rack five, section three, you will have a book. You know that is where the book is supposed to be. But you don't find the book there. The book is mislaid. The book is in some other place where it is not supposed to be. That is called purloin. That is purloin. It's a, it's a rather peculiar word even in English. It's not a very common word. So it's not stolen. It's more like a letter which is not in its place. A letter which is elsewhere. A letter which is not in its place or elsewhere. Uh, so far, any problem with uh, hearing or understanding? 
Good. Thank you. Okay. So I'll proceed. Now, uh, let me try and discuss this story because, as I said, we don't have enough time to go into the nitty gritties of the text. One thing that you will notice in this story is that it is peppered with uh, French words, peppered with many quotes from not only French literature, but also other uh, traditions of literature. It begins with an epigraph from Seneca. It ends with another quote from Crebillon. So there's a, there's a huge amount of francophone culture that the text refers to. So again, that's one of the interesting things one could say about Edgar Poe, how Edgar Poe travels as a writer from one country to another through his writing because of a certain inbuilt reference to these other countries. As I say, the story is set in Paris. Now, in a typical uh, detective story scenario, we do not have the detective as a narrator. Again, think about this. How many times do we have the detective himself or herself narrating a story? It's actually rarer. Uh, it's much more you know, uh, conventional to have another narrator. Uh, again, think of in the Indian context, you could think of Bonkesh and Ajit. You could think of uh, Feluda and Jotayu, the character of Jotayu, who is you know, brought in as a writer, as a character who is a writer. Ajit is a writer too in Sharuddin Bull's stories. So again, this story is narrated by an unnamed narrator. And it's a, it's a conventional thing in many of Poe's stories. This unnamed narrator seems to be the roommate of the detective, the roommate of August Dupont. Now, what is this case? So the story opens again in a very conventional detective genre where we have, uh, you know, uh, it's Paris and we, we are given the details of the address where Dupont is. And Dupont is uh, having a conversation with his, uh, with, his, with his friend, the narrator of the story. They're talking about some of the earlier uh, cases like the murder in the Rue Morgue and the murder of Marie Roger. So in a very pop cultural way, the story refers to the two previous installments of the Dupin narrative, something that we see a lot, for example, in Sherlock, a lot of back reference to other texts. So uh, that's where we begin and we have Monsieur G. Now you would see that most of these characters in the story, apart from Dupin, are not named. They're simply mentioned as a letter. So. The, the, the Monsieur G is the prefect of the Parisian police. He comes in to consult Dupont about this particular case of a purloined letter. Uh, you would also notice on the first page of the story that the particular year of the story is not mentioned. It says one dusty evening in the autumn of 18 something. There's a dash. So this use of ellipsis or this use of dash is there throughout the story. Uh, so we are not given all the explicit details. The names are not there. The year is not there. And many such details, as we will see, are missing. Uh, so the prefect of the Parisian police comes in. Uh, and the case is uh, something that revolves a Perloin letter. So a letter that was addressed by some unknown person uh, has been purloined by the minister. The minister is a character called D. Again, the letter is mentioned. We don't have the full name. But, you know, mark the fact that Dupin also starts with D. So there seems to be some sort of a symmetry established between the so-called criminal, the one who purloined the letter, and uh, the detective himself, Dupin. So uh, there are two Ds. Uh, in any case, so the prefect comes in and he says that a letter has been purloined. But before we go into that, there's an interesting sentence here. So uh, when the when the prefect comes in, it's evening, and there isn't a lot of light in the place where Dupa and the narrator stay. And uh, Dupa wants to light a lamp, but then he says, and I'm quoting from the text. If it is any point requiring reflection, we shall examine it to better purpose in the dark. Uh, so it's a very interesting sort of proposition. And then uh, uh, the prefect calls it odd. He calls this 
observation odd. So the observation is, if we are reflecting on something, why not begin in the dark? So again, we have this movement from darkness to light, a movement from some sort of a secrecy, some plot that is being hatched to the knowledge that will come at the end of the story. So one thing to clarify is that this is not a who done it in the sense. It's not a who done it in the sense that we already know who has done it, who has purloined the letter. We know it's the minister. So it's more about where the letter is kept and how the letter can be retrieved. It's more about the logic of that method rather than the who done it in the classical sense. So just a quick reference to something that you might find interesting here. Michael Holquist, the, uh, the famous uh, scholar of the works, uh, uh, I mean, in any case, let's not, let's not go into that. But in any case, Michael Holquist calls a certain tradition of uh, stories, detective stories, metaphysical whodunit. This is the expression Michael Holquist uses, metaphysical whodunit. Uh, now, in this essay on the metaphysical whodunit, uh, Holquist goes at length to talk about uh, Edgar Allan Poe's experimentation with the who done it as a form. Now, I'll just quickly point out one interesting uh, argument he is making or he's speculating. So Edgar Allan Poe was conventionally considered a madman. There were many issues that he had with psychological ill health, uh, partly because of his addiction to uh, drugs and alcohol and many other stuff. So uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Flirtation with madness is something that is testified by his life. Now, Holquist makes a very interesting point when he suggests that writing detective stories is like an autotherapy for Edgar Allan Poe. Someone who's losing his rationality is trying to uh, revive his rationality by writing detective stories. That is the, uh, the, the gist of the argument. Holquist seems to make. If madness is considered a failure of rational structures, the point is perhaps writing a fudan will help one to revive those rational structures. Because if you think of it, whodunit or detective story is the perfect, logically speaking, it's the perfect structure where something has to be deconstructed step by step in a very logical way. So we are looking at this dialectic of logic on the one hand and madness on the other hand. And Holquist's point is perhaps Poe, by writing these short stories, which are detective stories, is trying to address his own failure of nationality. Is this point clear? Yes. Is, okay. Thank you. So uh, we'll move on. Uh, Right. I'm, I'm also looking at this story on the screen, so you'll have to bear with me if I stop for a while. Now, the, the second point that I want to mention here, continuing from this structure of the whodunit. So the structure of the whodunit is a logically recursive structure. Someone has done something and the detective uh, is supposed to take all the rational steps to deduce what has been done, to reconstruct what has been done. So it's a reconstructive or recursive logical structure. Now, what is interesting in this story is that it refers to many games. Uh, it's a major theme in the story, game, game, some sort of a gaming activity. So we'll, we'll talk about two games here. One is the, the odd and the even. And the second is a map pointing game. So the odd and the even and a map pointing game. We'll come back to these two games. But the point is, the whole idea of a detective story is also like a game. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You're trying to get the pieces together and make the puzzle work or, or find the solution. So I've already said that the prefix called uh, Dupa's statement that we should begin in the dark and then go into the light through our reflection, he called this observation odd. So uh, from the beginning, Dupa says that this case seems to be simple and odd at the same time. 
simple and odd. There's a simplicity about it, but it's also odd. It is from this expression, simple and odd, that we go to the game of the even and the odd. And we'll come to that. Uh, throughout the story, a major motive that keeps coming back is logic. Logic, inference, rationality. And if you think of it, a game is also governed by some sort of a logic, a central logic by which you play the rules and regulations of a game and then how you apply, how you respond to those rules and regulations when you play the game. So there's always a certain operational logic at work. Now, let's keep these expressions in mind, game and logic vis-a-vis -vis a crime narrative or a, let's say a narrative of theft. I mean, it's, it's not about murder, this one. It's more about theft. So, and from the very beginning, you will see that both Yufa and the narrator, they have an extremely rational way of talking about cases. So, for example, uh, you know, again, looking at the situation, uh, just, just give me a second, please find out the phrase. Right. So, at one point, uh, Yupa and uh, so it's a conversation that is happening three way between Yupa, the narrator, and the prefect, and they're they're suggesting that perhaps the minister who has purloined the letter will never give it back. Now the letter belongs to the queen. We don't know the contents of the letter. This is one very interesting thing. Uh, that I think we will have to come back to next time when we talk about the story, that the entire story is organized around a lack. And this is the lack of the content of the letter. So until the end, in fact, even at the end of the story, we do not know who wrote the letter, what is there in the letter. We just know that someone wrote a letter to the queen and the queen did not want this letter to be read by the king. And the minister took advantage of the fact that the queen could not be explicit about this letter with the king. And the minister purloined the letter. So that's the situation. Now, of course, we can commonsensically surmise that this might be about an affair, perhaps an affair that the queen is having, or perhaps an affair that the king is having. Perhaps there's a spy that the queen has you know, employed and this is a report coming from the spy. Or it, sorry, it could be that the queen is having an affair and it's about that. It's, it's the parama writing the letter. But these are our guesses. I mean, we can only guess because there is no content supplied to this letter. So let's just keep this point in mind that the entire story is, if I may say, formalized around a whole of content. The content of the letter is missing, and it is around this hole that the entire story is built, just the way the potter builds a pot around the central hole. The central hole is the missing content of the purloined letter. Okay, so coming back to this thread about logic, logic of the game and so on, uh, as I say, detection itself is an extremely logical procedure. So the narrator, early on in the story, when they're discussing whether the minister is going to reveal the letter or not, uh, the narrator says, if the minister reveals the letter, this will be some sort of an ascendancy. Something will fall upon the, the whole scenario, the, the kingdom and everything. But he also says, and just listen to the sentence and you'll get this logical tone that I'm trying to convey here. So, the narrator says, but this ascendancy would depend upon the robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber. The robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber. Doesn't it sound like a puzzle? It's, it's like a logical puzzle where you have to make out what is meant. So, the robber is the minister. The minister knows that the queen knows who the robber is. That's what this sentence means. The minister knows that the queen knows that the minister has purloined the letter. So 
The minister knows. What, what does he know? The minister knows that the queen knows. What does the queen know? The queen knows that the minister has to align the letter. So this ascendancy, if he comes out with the letter, uh, discloses and does a full-fledged expose, that expose would depend upon the robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber. So this is the logically you know, oriented note uh, or, or style that we see in this story it keeps coming back. It's a, it's a logical style. I mean, think of metaphysical poets and how metaphysical poets would often write in the form of a logical style. Again, there's a slightly puzzling logical style here. So responding to this comment, we understand as we move on that yes, uh, the queen very much knows that the letter has been purloined by the minister and the minister knows that the queen knows. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is they, they keep discussing this, whether or not uh, the minister will ever expose the letter. Maybe he will never expose the letter. Maybe he will just hold on to it as a potential power. And this is uh, something that, again, we will come back to later on, perhaps in uh, the next class. But the letter as potentiality. The letter represents power as a potentiality, not as an actuality. If you actualize it, the power goes away. As long as you keep it in the form of a potential, it's there in your power bank, as it were. Okay. So the letter represents the power of potentiality. And again, just to make a quick uh, connection, because that's where I'm coming with this, uh, potential and actual. These are two major categories that Aristotle developed as a philosopher when he was talking about you know, logic, among other things, not just logic, but also logic. Uh, so again, we are coming back to some of these uh, broader philosophical notions about what potential power is and what actual power is. Actual power also is like an exhaustion of the power. If you keep the power, it remains forever, as it were. And it's like a trump card that you can show that, oh, I have your letter. Do not do anything uh, here and there because I have access to this letter. So it's a, it's a power of the potential. Let's keep that point in mind. Okay. Um, right. So uh, we understand that, uh, as I say, the queen very much knows that the, the minister has purloined the letter. So the robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber is not very much there. Right. So uh, just to cite this passage where I was basing myself when I said something about the potential. So the narrator says, as you observe, that the letter is still in possession of the minister, since it is this possession and not any employment of the letter which bestows the power. With the employment, the power departs. So it's about the potentialization of power, uh, a potentialization of power through the letter. That's what we're looking at. Okay. Now, let me continue. Another interesting thing about this story is that it's a very, very discursive story. Discursivity is uh, a condition certain kinds of narratives. What is discursivity? When you open up a lot of thematic or conceptual ideas in a story. Now, not all stories will do that, but this story very much does it. I mean, so it, it wants to engage with a, a lot of discourses. The discourse of poetry, the discourse of logic, the discourse of mathematics, and we we come to this in due course. Uh, but it is a very discursive story. Uh, it's it's like a story of ideas. Some of you might be familiar with the expression "novel of ideas." It's like a story of ideas. Okay, so um, this this uh, minister is considered a poet as well as a fool. So again, we'll come back to this correlation between the poet and the fool. So at one point, uh, 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 G, the prefect, says, but then he's a poet, which I take to be one removed from a fool. 
And then Dupa says, well, that's true, but I have been guilty of certain doggerel myself. So there seems to be a certain undermining of poets and poetry, or a certain undermining of the poetic craftsmanship, possibly because there's a simple binary here between logic and poetry. The rational act of the detective is contrasted with the poetic act, which is considered some sort of a foolery, as it were. So again, we'll come back to this idea of the poet as a fool. Uh, but the poet as a fool is also someone who can be a trickster. And that's what the minister is. The minister is a trickster. As I said, this entire story is about the logic of trying to find the letter. Now, let me go into the story a little bit uh, more. So there are two parts to this process of detection. The traffic comes and tells both the detective and the narrator that Polis has made a very detailed and exhaustive search of the minister's apartment. And every single inch of the minister's apartment has been exhausted. They have not been able to find any. Okay. Just to give you an idea about the exhaustive nature of this search, let me read out a little passage. So, are you able to hear and understand what I'm saying? Is the voice clear? Okay, thank you. So, I'll just read out a little section here. So, this is the prefix talking about the police search. We opened every package and parcel. We not only opened every book, but we turned over every leaf in each volume, not contenting ourselves with a mere shake, according to the fashion of some of our police officers. We also measured the thickness of every book cover with the most accurate admeasurement and applied to each the most jealous scrutiny of the microscope. Had any of the bindings been recently meddled with, it would have been utterly impossible that the fact should have escaped observation. So they take great pains, in fact, to you know find out whether the letter is there in the apartment. They, they do all kinds of things, things that is possible. So again, in this detection or in this method of detection, this to rule is a mathematical principle of measurement trying to find out every little, you know, depth of the space, every little nook or cranny that could possibly be there. So they're trying to find the letter, of course. They're not leaving any stone unturned, quite literally. So they go into each uh, furniture, open it up, each book, open it up, check the binding. They do all kinds of things possible. Even one-tenth of a line uh, of every furniture. And once you read the story, you will see how mathematically this entire search has been described. So mathematical, uh, you know, trope is a trope that goes hand in hand with rationality, a certain kind of calculative rationality. Okay. So mathematics and calculative rationality are very much the method adopted by the police and yet they cannot find the letter. So, uh, after, you know, this entire search, Prefix is absolutely certain that the letter is not in the premises. Uh, and the narrator seems to agree. The narrator says, you've been making a miscalculation, and the letter is not upon the premises, as you suppose. Uh, now, this is the, the interesting point. The, the observation that Dupin makes later on is that, no, the letter is very much there. You are exhausting the wrong dimension of space. Okay, so let me explain this a little more clearly. So there are two ways of hiding something. You could hide something by actually hiding it in the you know deepest recesses of a place or you could hide it by not hiding it. You could hide something by keeping it out on the open. And the idea is because the one who's looking for the letter is going to go for hiding, the fact that you have not hidden the letter will work in your favor. It's too obvious. So if I keep a letter on my table, you would think that letter cannot be the letter because it's out there in the open. 
so let me try and you know see the drawers and all the little you know nooks and crannies of the space so we are talking about two different paradigms of space here space as depth and space as surface so the the minister is intelligent enough to understand that everyone would look for it in the depths of his apartment in fact as the prefect say he is not around in most of his uh, you know uh, nights when uh, the apartment is searched and in fact later on dupont will make this observation that the minister deliberately makes this play as if as if he's playing with the police force he knows that the force will not be able to find it he himself goes out makes room for the police investigations the searches and it just makes a fool out of the entire police force so they are looking for the letter in the depths whereas the letter is on the surface they are looking for the letter in hiding whereas the letter is not hidden it's it's you know right on the surface it has not been hidden that's the strategy of the minister so um let me read a portion again um the measures then this is dupa the measures then he continued for good in their kind and well executed their defect lay in their being inapplicable to the case and to the uh, sorry just give me a sec to the man so this first point not that they did not search well but their search was not applicable to the case or to the man as in the minister a certain set of highly ingenious resources are with the prefect and okay we'll just uh, skip that bit uh, and, and read a little further so this is where we are coming to the game of even and odd dupa goes into the game of even and odd to explain the rationality of the thief how the minister hides the letter is being explained here by dupa and i'm reading because this is the description of the first of the two games i mentioned remember the even and the odd and the second is map pointing so we'll come to that uh, even and the odd echoes that early expression in the story simple and odd now let's come to this description a school boy is a better reasoner than he i knew hmm, about 8 years of age the success at guessing in the game of even and odd attracted universal admiration this game is simple and is played with marbles one player holds in his hand a number of these toys and demands of another whether that number is even or odd if the guess is right the guesser wins if wrong he loses money now this is the principle of guessing that this 8 year old boy follow and he bamboozled everybody so let's read this now our school okay so this is uh, this is his principle of guessing so again i'm, I'm not going to read the entire thing but let's get the logic of this guessing the logic is first time you know so the 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 important point here is that whenever you're trying to outwit the other you have to try and guess how the other is thinking about the situation and you have to you know uh, tailor yourself according to your assumption about the intelligence of the other so one school one person uh, would say odd so uh, again you get the game right so the there are some marbles in his hands and the other person has to guess now the first time the other person says odd he loses the school boy loses because uh, it it turns out to be even so now the school boy is trying to pace the mind of the other person the first time he said odd and he lost which means it was even now this means perhaps this person is now going to make the number odd because it was even last time he might make it odd that works with a fairly simple game a simple as the text described so for simple term okay the first time i did even next time i'll alternate it with odd but if the other person is a little more intelligent the other person will be able to pace the school boy fine so this is what will happen in another variation 
the first time even number of marble marbles there the school boy guess is odd and he loses second time the school boy expects that it will be odd but the intelligent gamer knows that this expectation will be there so the gamer makes it even once again am i making sense so the second time it is even once again and that is guessed successfully by the school boy because he knows that the other person is thinking like this so one has to try and anticipate what the other is thinking whether you are simply thinking in terms of an alternation of even and odd or are you thinking of two evens at the same time two odds one after the other so again that's the logic again i understand that this might be a little complicated but if you read the story this will be very clear so uh, i'm just reading this principle here the the narrator says the principle is about an identification of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent an identification of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent so you have to identify with the intellect of your opponent you have to pace the mind of your opponent and see how he is approaching this or thinking about this okay so that's the first game and again what i'm suggesting is game is an intrinsic reference frame for any detective character because the detective is always playing a game as it were with the with the criminal it's uh, the wrong doer whoever uh, that person is now the the point i'm making about fools and poets uh, is this so at one point this is a comment uh, made by just check once yeah this is a comment made by dupont says all fools are poets this the perfect sorry this the perfect field and he is merely guilty of non distributio medi in thence inferring that all poets are fools so again you see the direct evocation logic so the undistributed middle is a particular fallacy of aristotelian law you know when the the middle is undistributed uh, you might think that the reverse of every statement the reverse of every true statement is also true but that is not the case the reverse of every true statement is not always true even though all fools are poets all poets are not fools okay that's that's the point but why did i read this out again to make you aware that logic is a theme in the story logic is a motive a theme in the story so this undistributed middle is an evocation of aristotelian propositional logic okay um and there's also this speculation that the minister is a mathematician not just a poet he's also a mathematician he has done differential calculus and so on so there's a reference to that right so so far uh, is there any problem in understanding what i've said please clarification the last point the the clarification about what last point the point about the logic no they're good no we are good so what we might do is uh, after this class perhaps before the next class if you have some questions please feel free to you know let uh, either uh, professor bhattacharya or professor mukit you know and and i can get the questions and i can work on them before we do the next class but let me try and finish this how much time do we have 15 minutes 15 minutes yes please 15 minutes okay. thank you so i'll 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 try and wrap up at least the story in the next 15 minutes okay now there's a long uh, discourse i would say on mathematics and mathematical logic here, which i would briefly want to go into because it's a very interesting question here so dupa had a completely different take on the the revival of the pulling letter he is absolutely certain that the letter has not been hidden and the police is not able to find the letter because they are taking it for granted that the letter has been hidden 
So the police's method is an extremely mathematical method. Measurement is the key to that method when they're searching the apartment. On the other hand, Dupin's method is not mathematical, even though it has a logic of its own. So we are looking at two emissaries, mathematics and logic here. The polis represent mathematics, Dupin represents logic, which is not reducible to mathematics. And again, this goes to, uh, uh, speaks to a very long history that I do not have the time to recount here, but the history of mathematics uh, is always a battleground between mathematics and logic. There is a certain strand of mathematicians called logicists who think mathematics is all about logic. But then there are other mathematicians who would severely oppose that and say that mathematics and logic are two completely different things. They're not you know, kindred spirits at all. So what we have here is a decoupling or a separation of mathematics and logic. Mathematics is the method of the police, logic is the method of Dupin. With this point in mind, let's read some of the sections from this discourse on mathematics here. So this is Dupin. I dispute the availability and thus the value of that reason which is cultivated in any special form other than the abstractly logical. I dispute in particular the reason deduced by mathematical study. The mathematics are the science of form and quantity. Mathematical reasoning is merely logic applied to observation upon form and quantity. The great error lies in supposing that even the truths of what is called pure algebra are abstract or general truths. Again, I'm skipping a little bit. Mathematical axioms are not axioms of general truth. What is true of relation, form and quantity is often grossly false in regard to morals, for example. In this latter science, it is very usually untrue that the aggregated parts are equal to the whole. And then there are, there's a point again where it says there are numerous other mathematical truths which are only truths within the limits of relation. Let me explain this a little later. Thank you. Sorry, that was not you. Uh, okay. Right. So why, why does Dupin go into this, what in perhaps your generation you would call a rant, rant on mathematics? Why does he go into this? rant on math, uh, partly because he's trying to, if I may say so, deflate mathematics. Mathematics is considered this pinnacle of human reason, you know, the greatest uh, possible you know, capacity of human reason comes out in mathematics. And this is almost like worshipping mathematics, as it were. So he goes against that uh, almost religious uh, worshipping of mathematics and he says that mathematical truths are not general truths. They are also relative truths. They are also context specific truths. They are not applicable to anything and everything. So this is a critique of mathematical truth as any general truth. Okay, that's one point in this rant. The other point is for Dupin, mathematics is nothing but logic. Okay? So he's reducing mathematics to logic, which some mathematicians don't like at all. Okay? So he's simply saying that mathematics is a science of quantification, but essentially it is nothing but logic. Logic applied to observation upon form and quantity. That's what he says. So there seems to be this tension between mathematics and logic. Let's keep that point in mind and go forward. Um, okay, so this is where we come to the second game. The second game is a game about maps and map points. Now, in a, in a, again, uh, so it's again a very typical detective story situation. The narrator doesn't understand how Dupin is able to conclude that the letter is somewhere on the outside. 
not in the depth but on the surface and the intelligent detective tells you know the entire process to his roommate isn't that something that we see all the time with you know heluda explaining things away to jota you uh, similarly uh, you know uh, the detective is always a little more intelligent than the sidekick uh, or the sidekick writer so again we we'll have in sharodindu homkesh explaining things to ajit so similarly we have dupa explaining the method to uh, his sidekick the, the narrator and he says uh, well have you ever noticed which of the street signs with the shop doors are the most at- attractive of attention so you are in a market you see many you know street signs of course which one draws your attention it's a very subjective thing something might draw your attention but it may not draw my attention so it's, it's extremely selective and subjective and then he goes into this game this game which is about maps and his point is when you are doing map pointing i'm sure you have played that game sometime or the other so you're trying to find out a name in the map the name of some little place some people think if it's a little name small name it will be difficult to find but dupas point is those who are experienced in this game very well know that a small name is not difficult to find what is difficult to find is a big name that is stretched over the map across the map and it's it's a it's a it's a big name which has its letters stretched across the map so that kind of a, you know a name is more difficult to find so again uh, we come back to this famous sentence that george orwell the writer george orwell said that it's a continuous struggle to see what is right in front of our nose if you put something right in front of your nose you won't be able to see it so if something is obviously present on the surface it is difficult to find that whereas something in the depths is actually ironically easier to find i'll take 5 more minutes and finish i think i have that time so um, they also refer to the letter as a glove as a glove that has been turned inside out so if you turn a glove inside out you know you don't know basically uh, the, the contents are on the outer edge of the letter in this case so the letter has been kept on this uh, so i'm i'm going to now try and really summarize the rest of the story but you know if you have read the story you know it's already so what dupa does is dupa goes into the hotel goes into the minister's uh, apartment Uh, in a green uh, spectacle he is able to you know observe the apartment because of his green specs and you know he realizes he makes two visits in the first visit he realizes where the letter is he finds out the letter he he can clearly see that the letter is and i'm reading here on this trumpery filigree card back of this board so it's it's right there on the wall there's a card rack made out of piece board and it uh, that 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 link by dirty blue ribbon from a little brass knob just beneath the middle of the mantelpiece in this rack which had three or four compartments were five or six visiting cards and a solitary letter this last it was much soiled and crumpled it was torn nearly in two across the middle as if a design in the first instance to tear it entirely up as worthless had been altered and so on so so the letter is kept as like like dirt like piece of dirt right on the surface on the walls of the room that's why it was not found and the letter has been turned upside down which means the contents are up the contents are on the outer side of the letter which even makes it all the more innocuous imagine this if it's a top secret letter you won't keep it content up you would always keep it content down okay so again he makes uh, sure that there is no way people can suspect that letter so during his second visit he strikes up conversation with the minister dupa and during his second visit uh, he takes advantage of this street brawl so there's a noise in the street someone fires a gun or at least it sounds like a gunshot and when 
the minister is attending to that in a few seconds dupa replaces the purloin letter with a duplicate letter and this duplicate letter he had made after or let's say between his first and second visits so he had observed the letter observed the seal and made an exact replica now he places the replica there what's the point behind placing the replica this is a question the narrator asks and dupa says well that's because in this way the minister won't be able to know that he has already lost the letter so he will continue to have this illusory sense of power this power over the queen but actually the queen will have the power of the minister so the minister would think i still have the letter so i have the power but the real power would lie with the queen and here of course pa is representing the queen now i'll finish now but what is interesting is that again and that's where we come back to that idea of game detective story as a gaming narrative it's like a gaming narrative so at the end of the story dupa says in the replica letter i wrote something i did not keep it blank because i wanted to get back at the minister i wanted to play this little game with it's like a revenge as it were so what he writes in the letter are two lines from trebion's tragedy at tree and the lines in english would be translated as such a mean plan is unworthy of atreus but totally worthy of hystus so atreus and atreus and hystus are two brothers and this is a play by trebion I'll, I'll finish now, but this one clarification is important. So I see that Dupa and the minister both have their names starting with the letter D. Now, in this revenge tragedy, which is echoed in this final reference, uh, Atri, Atreus and Aeschylus, they are brothers. They are brothers. Okay, and it's a revenge tragedy about two brothers. So this has, of course, led to quite a bit. speculation whether we can consider the criminal and the detective as brothers okay maybe not brothers in the literal sense but they they have they are, as it were two sides of the same mind they are two versions of the same mind and this is again a classic trope that we see in a lot of detective stories where the detective and the criminal go hand in hand in a way because the detective has to piece the mind of the criminal the detective has to understand how the criminal mind works and how the criminal did whatever he or she did so it ends with this reference to trebion's atri which suggests that there could be some sort of a metaphorical brotherhood between dupa and minister d let's end it here uh, in the next class i will talk about the history of interpretation when it comes to this story uh, this story is heavily commented upon by the french psychoanalyst jacques lacan he wrote a famous uh, essay which was seminar essentially the seminar on the purloin letter jacques derrida uh, had a little bit of a dialectical opposition to that in his uh, book called purveyor of truth where derrida goes at length to talk about uh, Uh, the Pauline letter. Uh, Barbara Johnson has written on this. Uh, Freud's famous uh, supporter in France, Marie uh, Marie Bonaparte, is almost going to say Marie Antoinette. In any case, no. Marie Marie Bonaparte wrote a piece on this. So it has a very uh, illustrious series of you know interpretations coming from very different circles. There's a lot of psychoanalytic interpretation, but there's also broadly philosophical series of interpretations and we will also see that in recent times the story has been read as a historical and political narrative talking about contemporary paris and its royal politics you know so there's there's a lot of interesting you know ways in which the story has been interpreted to finish up i'll say what i tried to highlight in this first class apart from this textual reading that we did was the emphasis on logic and mathematics as methods of detection where mathematics may not work and we might have to come to logic 
where mathematics is reducible to logic or not reducible to logic. And I also try to draw your attention to this idea of uh, game, uh, detection as a game, detection as a game which has a logic of its own and the conventions of the detective story. Thank you. Uh, or, or, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Uh, we, we'll have to uh, first try and save this recording, so we're trying to do that. Sure. Yes, so we have a few questions, so if you could take that. Uh, I, I, I have time as long as you have time. Yes, so uh, it's not said enough questions, so it's, you know, you're asking to a teacher now. Yes, I can't hear you properly. Uh, and also, Orpo, if you could uh, tell us a little more on the idea of, you know, purloin, the, uh, in purloin letter in the next class. Okay. You can develop on that as well. Yep. So, I will just uh, ask you to repeat the translation of the last two lines. Of okay, okay. Anything else that you want to ask? No. Okay. So the last two lines, uh, I mean the the I'm sure you mean the echo. The echo is uh, the the reference to Crebion's at tree, and it means such a mean plan is unworthy of Atreus. A T R E U S. Such a mean plan is unworthy of Atreus, but totally worthy of Hystus, but totally worthy of Hystus, T-H-Y-E-S-T-E-S. -E -E and this is a play, 1707 play, a French play written by Crebillon, C-R-E-B-I-L-L-O-N, and it's called Atri, A-T-R-E-E. -E. Now, Edgar Allan Poe himself gives us the, the, the source of the quotation. That's written there, in the yeah. story itself. Yeah. So, any more questions uh, today? So, do let me know. We don't have too much time. So, you have to let me know. Yes, you have to Okay, so can you uh, or to repeat the French name, the Baudelaire's translation okay. once again? La Lettre Volée. La Lettre Volée. Uh, that will be B O L double E. B O L double E. It was uh, you translated. Spell it again, the La Lettre. So spell La Lettre is L L. Uh, okay, L A uh, L E T T R E and V O L double E. La Lettre Volée. But as I said, there's a little bit of an inaccuracy in this translation because it translates purloined as stolen. And we said, uh, you know, as we discussed, purloined doesn't necessarily mean stolen. It means mislaid. So any more clarification? Okay. Uh, yes, Arpo, you have to Yeah. So it's the whole that you said. Uh, mm. the story was, uh, is that a necessary plot hole? Is, is, sorry, is that? Is that a necessary plot hole for the story? Is that a necessary problem? I can't get that word. Plot hole. Plot hole. Plot, plot hole. Plot hole. Plot hole. Okay. 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 Right. 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 Okay. So uh, this is a good question, and uh, part of what we will say uh, in the next class will go back to this question. So let me give you a very brief answer because we'll come back to this again. Uh, yes, it's a necessary plot hole uh, in the sense that if the letter's content was to become very important, this would have been a very different story. It could have been a story about court intrigue, as I said, the maybe the queen's affair, uh, maybe the king's affair. It could have been a story about a romantic triangle, an extramarital affair that disturbs the court, and so on and so forth. Or maybe, who knows, some affair between the minister and the queen. So, I mean, that is entirely left out of you know, the story for our speculation. And I would suggest, if 
Poe had gone into the contents of the story, he wouldn't have been able to write a story which is more about the trajectory of the letter. It's not a story about what the letter has in it, but it is about the trajectory of the letter, how the letter circulates from one person to another. So initially, it came from some unknown person. It came to the queen. And then it was, in a way, purloined by the minister. So it went to the minister. And then from the minister, it goes back to Dupa. From Dupa, we can you know, safely say that it goes back to the queen. So it's about the trajectory of the letter. And one point that we will come back to again in the next class is, we have to understand this letter not just as an epistle, not just as a letter, as an epistle, but also as a linguistic letter. Letter as a word, a signifier or a word. Uh, a lot of the you know, psychoanalytic and Deridian reading, uh, deconstructive reading of the story has to do with the fact that this letter is seen as an allegory of language. So the story is quite conventionally read by Laka, Derrida and others as an allegory of language and how the signifier or the letter has a certain trajectory with us human subjects. So I'll go into this uh, in the next class. Anisha, yes. Anisha, you need to start. Is the letter a symbol of the repressed unconscious of the queen? Okay, okay, All right. So that's also a question that uh, anticipates what we will talk about in the in the in the next class. But yes, I mean that's the idea that if the letter is an allegorical signifier, let's say, uh, what is important is what kind of effect it has on others. So more than what it contains, the important thing is what kind of effect it might have on the other. So let's say the letter is like a ghost. We do not understand a specter very well. But that's because, uh, I mean, that's the reason why we continue to be fascinated by the specter. Because we don't quite understand. Now, what does the letter represent? Does it represent the unconscious of the queen? I would say, in a way, the letter represents not just the queen's unconscious, but the intersubjective unconscious of all these people to whom the letter goes, uh, with whom the letter rests or exists. So again, we'll come back to this, how the signifier creates a certain chain of subjects. There are multiple subjects, human subjects, who are implicated in a chain by a signifier. And the signifier in this case is the letter. Any more questions? We are good for today? So then we thank Orko, Orko, thank you for your time. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you. So please let me know when we are having the next session. Right. So the next class would be on Tuesday at 11 in the morning. Tuesday at 11. Thank you. Perfect. So I think that works with you. Yes. Sure.